Hi guys, this is Mr. Tan, and today we're going to be reviewing the consumer buying behavior. We're also going to be, you know, acknowledging the value of understanding your target segments within the marketing process. We're going to be looking at evaluating the many factors which influence the consumer purchasing buying behavior, and we're going to review the consumer buying making process and the different types of buying um, behaviors and processes that we make generally as consumers. So before we start, um, can you think about what motivates you under the uh, various uh, situations? So if you were going to buy a drink in your local cafe, what would motivate you to want to go and buy a drink in your local cafe? What about booking a short break within the UK or your home country? So what would motivate you to want to book a short break either in the UK or your home country? And what about booking a two-week holiday in a country, you know, the other side of the world? What would motivate you to want to do that? A two-week holiday in a country, the other side of the world. So, what is consumer behaviour? So, studying consumer behaviour is one way of being able to manage demand. Consumers go through processes during which they make choices about buying decisions. And we need to understand how people buy and um, the factors that influence them because this will influence us in terms of the you know, marketing mix and also the marketing, integrated marketing um, promotional mix as well. Now, there are many schools of thought surrounding the idea of consumer behavior, many of which relate to psychology, sociology and uh, philosophy. But we're going to be looking at the, the whole model in its entirety. There are additional slides which break down each of the elements. But today I'm just going to be reviewing itself the whole model and talking through the different elements. Um, so why is it important to understand? Um, the competitive nature of the hospitality and tourism industry or any you know, goods and services in the private sector means that there are you know, thousands of establishments to choose from. You know. This isn't just on a local scale, but internationally as well. Therefore, the same companies and establishments are fighting for the same customers. If we took, to, you know, take from a, um, a domestic perspective, uh, a multi-domestic perspective, or even from a global perspective, companies wanting to go global, where be it in the tourism and hospitality industry or be it in for goods and services, you know, again, you need to understand consumer buying behavior. So in order to win this battle, organizations need to understand you know what the consumer wants you know and the ultimate question is how do consumers respond to the various marketing stimuli that a company might use um, and I actually think it's not really how they respond to it it's really how they understand um, how or what they're looking for and then to adapt the marketing stimuli accordingly in terms of how or what they're looking for. So I think, in my opinion, I think it's the other way around. So it's the marketing stimuli being adapted and created to get and influence consumers to act and behave in a certain way. So who buys? Uh, Blackwell, Minard and Engel, um, 2005 cited Jobber and Ellis Chadwick, 2016, identified there were five roles within the group decision making process. And by the way, and Engel, Collett and Blackwell um, also published in 1979 their you know, um, consumer buying behavior model. And this was back in 1979 they had this model and now there have been other consumer behavior models which um, they cite in terms of the um, group uh, decision making process and of different roles so this may be particularly relevant to hospitality and tourism products um, you know there may be they can be taken by parents children or any other members of the group buying center you know therefore making it important to understand what makes up a group so there are groups but there are also the different types of buying behavior 
um, types and then how those buying behavior types are influenced and categorized. So now we are moving on to the um, uh, buying behavior model and process. And we can see that um, the first stage for this is, is the um, problem recognition. So if I circle the problem recognition, the need of problem recognition, this is where it kind of like all starts. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we need to say to ourselves, well, you know, what is a need? So if we think about a need, then we think about um, the actual state and the desired state. So, so if we think about the um, the two lines here, then we can see <coughs> that if A represents the actual state in terms of, you know, uh, what exists, and D represents the desired state. Now, when the desired state only, you know, um, differs and deviates from a small distance from the actual state, then we can see, you know, yeah, we kind of like want this, but we're not really taking action to um, go out and buy this product or search in terms of alternative evaluation. But when the um, desired state sufficiently deviates from the actual state to such a degree where you can take it no longer, then you take action. So really, if we think about what a need is, we could say that a need is a deep felt feeling, a gut feeling inside of you where the um, desired state sufficiently deviates from the actual state to such a degree that that causes you to take action. So if we take um, the example of you know you running out of food, so in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, psychological needs, um, you need food and water and drink. So if you, you ran out of food, then you know you have a problem. So here we can see the desired state sufficiently deviates from the actual state to warrant you to go out and now buy something that you've run out of, for example. So what happens here? Um, let's take a specific example and we say it's a, um, it's a uh, cup of tea or a brand of tea or coffee, predominantly a you know, low involvement type good, um, which involves kind of like routine problem solving. So here now we're talking about a routine problem solving because let's say you've already bought the milk and coffee or food like you normally do weekly and you've tried the, the coffee and you've tasted it so you, you like this coffee so you've run out of coffee now so the desired state sufficiently deviates from the actual state because you want a cup of coffee so you decide to go to the shops. So you know um, the first thing you do is you search doing in internal search internal search so if we do internal search here, so we do internal search in terms of the brand of coffee that we want to buy. And where are we doing internal search? Well, we're doing internal search into our minds, into our own memory. And we're saying to ourselves, well, what brand of coffee do I normally buy? I normally buy this brand of coffee or this type of food. And then I'm out of stock of this. Um, you go to the shops and you do internal search, you know, you bought this before, you're happy with this, as long as you're happy with it, so you're satisfied with this, you tried and tested it. So you go into the shop and then you look at what you normally buy, which you access the information from your memory, your mind, and then if the product is on the shelf, then you buy the product. And this is called a routine problem solving decision making process. This is routine. <clears throat> and if we think about routine problem solving, predominantly we don't really want to go shopping and keep changing our brands every time because it'd be too time consuming. It would take too much 
thought process in terms of our brains to continually check every single item for low purchase, low involvement type goods um, when we don't really want to do it, at, when we've already tried and tested something and we're happy with it, so we just buy what we normally buy. This is routine problem solving. Um, but let's say you go into the shop now and you do internal search and you're happy that you want to buy your you know, Maxwell's coffee, if it's your brand of coffee. But you go to the shop and you find that there's no Maxwell coffee. So what do you do? So now we have um, limited problem solving. Limited problem solving where <clears throat> you actually go to the shop. It's a low involvement good, low cost <clears throat> and low risk. And in this low involvement cost and risk, you, now, you, again, you go to the shelf, your brand is out of stock. You then again do internal search into your mind and say, well, what have you tried before what have you had before and now you might try and pick up on memories in terms of what other people have had or what you might have tasted in addition to your normal or standard brand of coffee and then you might select something else you might spend a limited amount of time looking at the alternatives and decide okay on this occasion I'll try this brand because my brand is out of stock so this type of problem solving decision making process is called um, limited problem solving so <clears throat> there we have limited problem solving we also have um, impulse purchase impulse purchasing so if we go to the shop and we are looking at the um, <clears throat> products and we go to sh to queue up and you might see a, a, a stack of sweets or goods which are low item you might think yeah, I might have one of those. And normally shops and retailers put these impulse type purchases near the cash, near the till to get you to on impulse. You haven't really decided that you wanted that, but you see it there and you fancy it. So you just take it. And even if you go into shops like Lidl or Sainsbury's, which has a bakery and you're passing the bakery, you may not have decided to want to buy a cake or pastry, but the smell and you know the smells of the bread or the cakes is now impacting upon your senses and that might get you to want to um, you know buy or on impulse a cake or a pastry or bread having smelt it nice and fresh and being baked so again we can see impulse type purchasing so now we've kind of like talked about <clears throat> routine problem solving We've talked about limited problem solving when something is out of stock and we've kind of like mentioned impulse um, purchasing. Um, you know, the, the next question is what about um, situational factors? What type of situational factors could affect your buying decision process? Well, if we look over here and I'm going to circle this now, the situational factors here. So the situational factors can affect <clears throat> your buying decision process. But let's take an example. Let me ask you the question. For um, two gallons of petrol, would you pay £75 for um, a small little jerry can of petrol, um, two gallons of petrol? So would you pay £75 for a small jerry can of petrol, um, two gallons? Would you, would, would you pay for that? Well, you might think that a small jerry can of petrol, um, a few gallons of petrol, for £75 is too expensive and you might say to yourself well no I wouldn't buy that but hang on a minute because it really depends on the situation so this situation here so if you were driving on the motorway and you ran out of petrol and you wasn't too far from a petrol station um, then you would phone up the RAC and then they would charge you to bring down a small can of jerry can of petrol maybe £75 so the question is, would you pay for it? Yeah, of course you would pay for it because otherwise you'd be still stuck on the motorway. So when we talk about situational factors in terms of people paying over the odds for specific goods and products, yes, people would do it depending upon the situation. And even if we think about COVID-19, when people were stuck in various countries and there were no more flights, people had to pay exorbitant you know costs and prices to get another flight back home i heard of one person um, having to pay five thousand pounds for a flight to get back home one way 
So again, depending upon the situation and the circumstances, you might actually pay a, a lot more for those um, products or services. And then um, the next thing that we need to think about is, you know, um, extended problem solving. So the question really is, what is, you know, extended problem solving? Well, extended problem solving is where there is high risk and high value and high product involvement. So you have high product involvement, high risk and high value. In, in other words, if you make a wrong decision in terms of this, then it might cost you. So if you were going to buy a car, if you were going on holiday and taking the family away, um, costing you know 500 to a thousand pounds, if you were going to buy a fridge freezer, if you were going to buy um, um, uh, you know a washing machine, then and it involved in terms of your perception it being um, you know high involvement, high risk, and high value, then you know this could potentially be a extended problem solving. Um, buying decision making process. So what really defines the difference between um, limited problem solving, routine problem solving and impulse purchase, purchasing in regards to extended problem solving. So the difference in terms of Engel, Collin and Blackwell, how they define extended problem solving is when um, a consumer takes ex external research external search and now so if we look at the model here and we say now we go down to external search because if you think about it this is now high risk high involvement and high value and you you the first thing you still do is the internal search into your memory and your mind to determine and find out what is the situation but you may not have all the information and you may not want to make a decision on terms of what you already know because you may feel that you don't know enough so in this instance here you go to external search what does external search mean? it means to search outside of what you already know <coughs> to, to determine more and to gather more information so this external search could be to ask friends and family to go on social media now we link this external search to the um, marketing stimuli and the marketing stimuli um, is going to include social media it's going to be it's going to include the internet it's going to include asking friends asking family it's going to include advertising sales promotion personal selling on billboards on bus packs on TVs on newspapers and magazines texts whatsapps Facebook so these are all part of marketing stimuli and marketing stimuli are from the companies, marketing companies, and the marketing companies expose you to all this marketing information. So now this marketing stimuli is where you, we are exposed every single day. So here we can see that we are exposed every day in terms of marketing stimuli. But if you think about it, all the marketing material that we take on board every single day, we don't actually take in. We don't retain everything we see on TV. We don't retain everything we see on the bus backs on billboards. We just don't. We are exposed to them. Absolutely. Um, so we are exposed to them and this creates, um, you know, depending upon how good or not the ads are, this will create attention. And then if this creates uh, our attention, then we look at those and then this leads us on to, do we understand this? Do we understand? Do we comprehend? And what is our perception and comprehension of this? And then we're looking at this marketing stimuli and we say, you know, do we understand, do we comprehend this? And again, if we're doing external search, we look at the marketing stimuli and we look what's out there, what, what we know, and then we start doing more searches. What's, what creates our attention on the internet? What creates our attention on websites? What creates our attention on the web, web reviews? And then we will try and make some kind of degree of understanding of this in terms of comprehension. And then if we understand it, then this would lead into acceptance, yielding acceptance. And then if we accept it, this material, we believe in it, then this will lead on to retention. Retention, we retain it in our minds, in our memory. 
So then again, this leads on to our mines. We retain it. And here we have done external search. But when we look at, um, you know, extended problem solving, then we need to say to ourselves, well, if we are doing external search, and even if we are buying on a routine basis, we would have bought the first time a specific product before we became happy with it. So we would have done some search on it. Even if it's limited problem solving, we would try and find out what we know or look on the shelf. But what would really influence us are, the, are these variables here. So these variables here in terms of uh, variables influencing the decision making process which includes the individual characteristics and the social influences now the individual characteristics you know includes the, you know the consumers resources their motives their values and lifestyle and also you know the social influences including their culture their reference and their family groups reference groups and family groups and all of this is going to affect us uh, and when we think about the variables that affect us we're saying well how does it affect us well if we link look at the next three boxes we have the um, beliefs attitudes and intentions now the beliefs attitudes and intentions actually form um, our link between our minds in terms of our beliefs, our attitudes and intentions. And if we think about, um, you know, some some philosophers say, some people say that Descartes came up with the the, the the phrase, I think, therefore I am. So Descartes meant that because we think, therefore um, we exist. But there are some who say that uh, this was said earlier by Socrates 2000 years earlier and he said I think therefore I am and what he meant was the way we think is the way we act and the way we behave so in the same way the way we think is going to affect our behavior in terms of what we buy and why we buy these goods and the our beliefs and our attitudes which translates into our intentions which is going to influence the purchasing and the alternative evaluation uh, evaluation stage of the consumer extended pro extended consumer buying decision process and these in turn are going to be influenced by the individual characteristics of you know consumer resources how much they've got um, the motives, their values and lifestyles and also the you know social influences in terms of the culture, reference groups and family. Hence the reason why when we think about these variables here we're thinking about segmentation. So you know um, So we are actually thinking about segmentation and we're saying to ourselves, well, how do we segment the market up before we do our targeting? And as we know, we segment the market up by various um, segmenting categories, including uh, behavioristic segmentation, our usage, our purchase, how much we buy, how regularly, how much do we pay? Um, our psychographic segmentation in terms of our preferences um, and our profiles uh, in terms of um, you know demographic segmentations the you know the age groups the sex the income brackets um, and then demographic segmentation in terms of the area where we live and then after that you go into targeting and targeting would then be who or what categories and elements within segmentation are we going to be focusing on and then after we've defined clearly our targeting 
in terms of our customers, then we say, how are we going to position it? How are we going to brand it? The brand positioning and positioning strategy in relation to the competitors. So, which is going to be affected by our beliefs, attitudes, and tensions, which are going to be um, affected by, you know, the consumer, the resources, motives, values, lifestyle, culture, reference groups, families, and so on and so forth. So this then leads into, um, you know, when, if you are a Muslim, you're not going to eat pork. So there are lots of Asian um, and African communities now, and Tesco is our tailor making, you know, additional food ranges targeting in those communities and those areas where they have stores, food ranges to meet those needs. And again, if you're targeting Muslims who don't eat pork, then they will contain the appropriate uh, ingredients and so on and so forth that do not include those uh, to, to enhance them so that they were actually, you know, if they're looking at alternative types of foods in terms of buying, then obviously that would be a main important uh, factor when deciding in terms of alternative search. Now, when we look at the extended problem solving, and alternative search, we said that that's going to be dependent upon the way we think, in terms of our beliefs, attitudes, and tensions, which is always influenced by the um, you know individual characteristics and the social variables. Hence, the reason why we segment, target, and position our products in the minds of our target market. But then there are two types of the extended problem-solving category. There is um, compensatory decision rule of extended problem-solving and any non compensatory decision rule of um, extended problem solving and if we look at the um, extended um, compensatory decision rule we are saying that how or what how do people buy in terms of alternative search evaluation of extended problem solving in terms of a compensatory decision rule so we're talking about a um, compensatory so if i put it up here so one compensatory so uh, compensatory so one is a compensatory decision rule and so what we're saying here is that the consumer looks at all the benefits of the product and weighs up all these benefits and then does a calculation in comparison to the other products and says well overall this product is better because it has these additional benefits and you've kind of weighed them up in your mind and then the other type of category is a non-compensatory decision rule of extended problem solving and a non-compensatory decision rule of um, extended problem solving basically means that the consumer says well I'm looking for this one criteria and it must meet this one criteria and then once it's met that criteria then you look at all the other uh, uh, factors and you say then it must meet this criteria but it may meet one or two main criteria so you might say well the holiday must be on the 200 pounds you may only have 200 pounds to go on holiday so you say I can't afford anything else so I can't be looking for cruise ships at 200 pounds so I can only go on a holiday for 200 pounds so that's all I'm looking for so that is a non compensatory decision rule as opposed to a compensatory decision rule where the consumer um, kind of tallies up all the benefits of the product summed up together and does a mental calculation so how does this then affect the marketing stimuli so then when we think go back to here the marketing stimuli how does it affect that well it affects it a great deal because if you think about it um, you need to take into consideration your target market and how you're positioning it obviously so the packaging the communication of the promotional mix the promotional mix including the advertising sales promotion personal selling public relations direct sales so here the message needs to be consistent depending upon the positioning strategy and the brand image and who you're targeting but also if you're targeting a group of people with a compensatory decision rule then you're going to want to put all of those benefits together so you're going to want to list all those benefits together because you know that person is taking a compensatory decision rule so they're summing up all of the benefits so you want to have as many benefits as possible and the key benefits that has the highest value in relation to that target market uh, and and as many as possible so that they sum up the whole thing and then they go with 
that type of product as an alternative evaluation. But if you are a customer of a target market and a positioning strategy where you are going for a non compensatory extended problem solving decision rule, then you are basically taking uh, one or two key attributes and you're focusing on that as being the key and main message to get across um, in terms of your marketing stimuli. Now, when we think about the marketing stimuli, again, we can further break this down in terms of um, um, uh, awareness, interest, desire and action so the ADA model awareness interest desire and action so when we're thinking about awareness creating awareness um, you know about the product interest in the product and it's at the desire stage where you might have sales promotions but the desired stage where you're focusing and uh, on the information as well in terms of you know the key attributes if it's a non compensated decision rule or the multi multi attributes if it's a compensatory decision rule in extended problem solving once we've got to this stage of alternative search and we know that alternative search have gone into external search and marketing stimuli then we um, then decide whether it's a compensatory non compensatory decision rule um, and then the marketing stimuli should be consistent with that message depending upon which which um, extended problem solving alternative search is this leads into your evaluation which leads in to you finally deciding to purchase now the buying decision model doesn't stop there because then it leads on to you know the outcome because after now you let's say you've gone on holiday or you've tried the product the question is are you satisfied or dissatisfied dissatisfied because if you are satisfied then this will reinforce the message to your mind that you're happy with it so you're satisfied with it. however if you're dissatisfied and it means you're not going to go back to the holiday or you're not going to buy this again which means you're going to need to do external search again external search again to do some more research to find out um, from the marketing stimuli again going into the process of exposure attention understanding yielding acceptance retention which um, product or service or holiday um, is going to be right for you to meet your needs okay so in essence this is the um, you know whole process of the consumer buying behavior model now within this model there are actually formula to work out um, a compensatory decision rule a non-compensatory decision rule if it's routine problem solving limited problem solving impulse purchase um, so there are all formulas within this um, model here to work out but we're not going into those formula today um, and a lot of those um, elements within the formulas of this model are, are quite subjective as well but overall it is important to understand this whole process um, you know it, it includes the first stage in terms of need and problem recognition you know in terms of internal search um, <clears throat> external search for alternative um, buying decision processes um, and then the influences on the, to on the customer in terms of the individual characteristics and the social influences in terms of cultural reference goods and family which lead into your segmentation targeting and positioning which influences because that influences their way of thinking in terms of their beliefs attitudes and tensions which will um, make be influenced which will influence their alternative evaluation selection evaluation and purchase so <clears throat> please bear in mind that understanding all this is I ultimately geared towards the marketing stimuli in terms and and the product to meet the customers needs and if you don't then the customer will be dissatisfied so understanding this will help you combine the messages combine your product um, your communication integrated communication um, promotional strategy and what you're saying how you're saying with the right um, brand image to meet your positioning strategy to meet the needs of your target market so I hope this today has helped from Mr. Tan. So thank you.